I really would like to welcome Giselle Farrow Puigbo, who is the new executive director of the Brookline Community Foundation. And Giselle started at absolutely the best possible time in history <laughs> as a new executive director for a nonprofit. She joined uh, Brookline Community Foundation August or September, Giselle? September. Um, and um, Really, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her as we were setting up this meeting and was greatly impressed with uh, our new executive director. Giselle started her career as an attorney in Southern Florida. She then moved on to nonprofits uh, where she held a variety of roles and gained expertise in um, fundraising, strategic planning, organizational development, community relations, uh, she has worked for several nonprofits, including Teach for America, which I know many of us are familiar with. She has also worked for a couple of nonprofits dealing with education and healthcare. Um, as she shared with me, she has a commitment and a passion for um, developing inclusivity in organizations, community organizations. And uh, with that, I will give this to Giselle. And I will remind you, Brookline Community Foundation holds the Winokur Rotary Scholarship Fund. So just to remind everybody, thanks to our dear member, Bo Winokur, uh, Brookline Rotary was able several years ago to donate $100,000 plus and set up a fund in perpetuity in our name um, and that goes each year to a scholarship for a Brookline High School graduate. So Giselle, take it away. Well, with that, I, I would say first, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, that support and enabling uh, educational equity for students in Brookline. Um, and thank you for the, the introduction. Uh, I've been really looking forward to, to this meeting and this conversation and, and sharing a little bit more about myself and certainly some of my thoughts about uh, the foundation and the future uh, of the foundation and partnership with others. Um, I it, So it was September when I joined the foundation, uh, really interesting moment in time for sure. And um, I, I really sort of consider uh, being in this role and having the opportunity to be the executive director of the Brookline Community Foundation as a real honor and a privilege. Uh, as, a, as a woman of color who's been in the fundraising and the nonprofit development space for close to 20 years, I truly never thought that I would have the opportunity to not only help shape the vision of an organization in and of itself, that is a privilege, um, but also continue to play a critical role with how funds would be distributed within a community. And, um, and I, I see that as a, a, an awesome responsibility. And I say awesome sort of in, in all the ways that that word uh, can be defined. Um, it's, it's a big responsibility and I take that very seriously. And I think about that every day. Um, about that privilege and that responsibility. Um, I think what I'd share too is there's, um, as intro to, to me as a human and a leader is that there's two um, things that have really marked me in my life. The, the first one is the fact that my own educational journey has shaped my life. Um, I, I'm an, uh, uh, my family is in, an immigrant family to this country from South America. Um, uh, I'm a first generation college graduate. Um, and, and despite sort of the, the barriers to high levels of educational attainment for Latinas in this country, I am in the very small percentage of, um, of Latinas who have a, a college degree um, a professional degree. Uh, and I think the last time I checked, it was about 4% uh, 
of Latinas who have a, a, a master's or higher. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. That has defined a lot of what I think um, matters to me as well as has shaped my the opportunities that I've had. Um, and, um, and it's also, I think, um, made me feel really urgent about um, the work that I have done in the past and I can do in the future uh, to remove some of those barriers for uh, communities of color and uh, students of color. The second huge learning uh, that uh, truly has shaped my career is the fact that I found work that is worth doing. Um, and, and hopefully I think you, you all uh, Sort of this will resonate with you um, uh, because of uh, the sort of involvement that you have with Rotary and, and uh, I'm making assumptions, but I think it's a safe assumption to make that you found a community and work that is worth doing for you. Um, I started my career out as an attorney. I think it's a beautiful profession. Um, and I litigated uh, for maybe almost four years. Um, uh, but I think even, even as I was in law school, I realized that um, that might not be my ultimate path. Um, and I found my way into the nonprofit sector really, really by chance. Um, I started out as a grant writer and then have spent the last um, 17 years in organizations primarily focused on communities of color and low-income communities, uh, working around educational equity, health equity. Uh, and um, I found uh, uh, this opportunity at the foundation and truly, truly, it, it while it was, um, I think one of the hardest year, it continues to be a hard moment in time for uh, the entire earth, certainly our country. Um, it is also um, a moment where at the time I was a health fundraiser in a pandemic and never before had I experienced um, an opportunity to engage with donors and philanthropists and community members where all of a sudden they immediately understood the correlation between having access to food, having safe housing, having access to transportation and employment and how that impacts your health. And where in the past it would take meetings upon meetings to be able to explain to someone how having a safe home it is actually a determinant of how healthy you are. All of a sudden, I think we were all thrust into a moment where we just innately understood it and it became relevant to us. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited uh, to be a part of the community of the Brookline community. Um, and um, I'll share one thing about my decision to join the foundation, which was, um, uh, I think the perception that the community has um, inside the community, outside the community, um, uh, that I remember seeing the role and I'd driven by the foundation a few times because my daughter goes to Goldfish uh, right here where the, where the building is. And I remember thinking, what is that building and what, what do they do there? Um, and then I, I saw the posting and I did some research and my first thought was um, a community foundation in Brookline, what would be the need? Um, and then I did a lot of research, uh, read a lot of the foundation reports um, and about some of the organizations uh, that are based here and support communities here and immediately sort of scolded myself for even having and making that assumption because being in the nonprofit space for a really long time, I understood that there is need everywhere. And when I looked at the data around poverty, um, education, housing here, it actually, in, in um, actually terrible ways, outperformed national averages. So higher uh, poverty rate here than the national average, and then immediately made the connection of uh, understanding that what's happening here in Brookline is exactly what's happening in every community across the country. Um, and I saw the opportunity of joining an organization uh, that I think is a, in a really unique moment in time 
um, that is centered and rooted in community. So I, I'm really excited to, to be able to partner with you, with others uh, to in, uh, improve the community in many ways. So I'll stop there. Um, and um, and uh, Susan, you had shared um, that it might be helpful for me to share maybe some of the thinking around the future of the foundation. Does that, does that, okay. Um, uh, I think, so there's been, I, I've been really fortunate to have joined an organization where I think the volunteer leadership is incredibly strong, it has a long history of engagement. Um, and um, my predecessor, uh, uh, did a phenomenal job in taking an organization um, and in many ways moving it forward and, and professionalizing it and thinking about the strategy um, and then thinking about partnership. And so I spent the first three, three months um, just being in conversation with as many people as I could, uh, learning about the issues, learning about organizations, um, meeting people, donors, local leaders, town leaders. Um, and, um, and that was really important because I think the main, um, I think the main, one of the main guiding principles um, in, in any role for sure, but certainly for a community foundation is um, I believe we must be accountable to community. And, and therefore, I, I, it would be unheard of for me to come into this role and into this organization and really envision a new future uh, for the institution without really hearing the experience that people have had and asking for their input. And so after a few months I've had, um, I'm starting to uh, develop um, thinking around what does it mean for the Brookline Community Foundation to, as our mission states, create opportunity and promote equity for everyone in Brookline? How have we been doing that in the past? And how can we both continue to do that, but push ourselves to do better, to do more of that? And um, uh, there's a couple of things that I'm thinking about. One is, um, I think, <laughs> as a lot of us have experienced this past year, and, and certainly I've been in organizations uh, uh, for almost two decades where uh, we would consider ourselves social justice organizations focusing on um, supporting communities of color. And I think what has been interesting is I, as I've stepped into this role and even <laughs> during the interview process is sort of a little inside information, but, um, my final interview with the board uh, involved a presentation around whether I thought we would be able to meet our, um, some of the goals that, that the foundation had laid out. And it was things like fundraising targets and um, number of convenings or issue briefs. And I remember doing that presentation and I, I spent quite a bit of time putting that together and practicing it on my husband, um, who I'm sure was tired of, of listening to me talk about it. Um, and in the end, I didn't do a presentation on whether I thought we could meet the goals. <laughs> I did a presentation on, and I was very sort of explicit about that, on how I thought the strategic plan and the work that the foundation did had to evolve and change to ensure that uh, the values of the mission statement um, around and the strategic plan around diversity, equity, and inclusion had to actually be integrated into all aspects of our work from fundraising, from strategic grant making to research and convenings. And I remember thinking there either going to hire me because this is a great presentation or I've gone too far and it's not the right fit. I'm happy to say it was the, the latter, uh, um, or sorry, the former and not the latter, but I came in with a real um, both passion but commitment to um, centering communities of color and centering those who are most impacted by the work in the decisions and in the processes. 
And so what that means for the foundation, what I think it's going to mean is um, certainly doing a lot of internal work with our board and our committees uh, to ensure that we do have diversity of representation and that people that are making decisions uh, on behalf of and for the foundation and for this community um, do reflect uh, our, the communities that we seek to, to support. And then more tangibly, what that also means is, um, and, and I've been on the fundraising side and in particular a grant writer submitting proposals to foundations. Um, and I always thought who makes those decisions and how do they, and is that transparent? And what's the framework for grant making? Uh, and so one of the things that I feel really strongly about is because this is a community foundation, I would like the community to be involved in the grant making process. And that is, I think, a market shift um, from how we've been operating, which I think has been wonderful and needs to evolve into more participatory grant making. Um, I, I, I don't know um, sort of your processes when you decide to fund a particular project or organization, but similarly, I'm making some assumptions around you're a set of community members coming from varied perspectives and places and coming together to make those decisions. That's, that's the move that I think, that's the place that we want to move into where it's not only our board, um, but members of the communities that are most impacted that have some sort of say in how we make investments. And because it's a community foundation and we maximize donations from hundreds of people in the community, I think offering ways for the community, for community members to engage in those processes is critical. So I'll stop there. Um, those are the, the, the two um, sort of significant ones and there, there are others, but I also want, I hope that this can be a conversation too, um, where you share your experience, your feedback, your input, uh, and even reactions as to what resonates about what I said and what doesn't. Uh, if you wanna talk, you're gonna to have to unmute your mics. Well, um, having been on the, the treasurer of the Brookline Friendly Society, which was the precursor of the community fund, the problems in Brookline are, are different than they were then. Um, uh, some of the root problems aren't. And um, you're reorganizing, your plan to reorganize things to make it more responsive to the community is very good. Uh, there is one thing that you are doing. Um, I believe you give, you have a, a fund for grants for people in trouble to Safety give them a net fund. Yeah, that fund I think is very, very important right now. Um, and uh, it may save some people from real disaster. The scholarships I think are very important in the high school, um, not just for uh, kids who have uh, very limited resources, but for the kids who get them and um, feel they get the scholarship gives them uh, feeling that they have worth, you know, that somebody else recognizes their talents and their and their work, and that's very important. I was going to ask. Um... I know that you've only been on since September and you've had other things that have been a priority, but um, you've got a lot of expertise and a lot of background in fundraising. And at this time, we know the need is great. What do you see in terms of the ability to raise the funds during these times that we need in order to support our community? So Thank you for asking that. I So first I'll say a comment about the safety net fund, which I think is, is also related to the, the, the fundraising question, Susan, but the safety net fund, one of the things that was surprising in, 
in a fantastic way was when I joined the organization, I, I learned about the success of the safety net fund um, it, it, because it's a partnership with the town who's contributed to that as well as the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health. And they are a huge partner in administering our safety net fund program so that they can support individuals who have acute need right now. And so the foundation can't make grants to individuals and therefore we have to partner with others that are able to do that. Um, and the, the thing that was actually surprising was that the, this community had the safety net fund and has had it for 20 years. And when the pandemic hit, there was no need to stand up a fund uh, for some for relief or res rapid response because the infrastructure and the ability to raise funds from the community to go to the safety net and then and then distribute it to the Brookline Center so that they can give it to individuals was already in place. And I, I think that's um, I, I had been a part of other conversations from my previous role working with communities across the country where they had to figure out what kind of process they would be able to use to do this uh, because a lot of organizations have restrictions to support uh, supporting individuals. Uh, so that was incredible. And the other thing I'll say about the safety net fund is the outpouring of support from the Brookline community has been tremendous. Um, it, we've sort of set record numbers this year uh, uh, for the fundraising and funds going to the safety net fund, which go directly to um, safety net fund needs. That includes food, housing, uh, transportation. And in a moment like this, uh, in this pandemic, it has also included things like technology, Wi-Fi, um, uh, thermometers, things that are uh, uh, things that we all either directly or indirectly need to sustain ourselves uh, through this um, through this moment. And so um, it's it's been wonderful. And so we we have a lot of support for the safety net fund, which then means that just uh, on Monday, uh, we put out a blast to our uh, to our community saying that we've expanded emergency assistance through the safety net fund because we have more funds than than we thought we would raise. Um, and not only are we continuing to make grants to the Brookline Center, but we are now accepting applications from other organizations, schools, um, uh, or or uh, or the town. Uh, if they have need for projects that are either directly or indirectly uh, caused by COVID. And so it's a real luxury, I think, for us uh, to be able to expand that funding. And for as long as there is need uh, that, that in this community and we can fill it, um, we're, we're committed to doing so. Um, and then to your question about fundraising, it's a, it's so hard to say. Um, I've been doing this work for a really long time, and on any given year, you just you you have a target. You hope that you're going to meet it. Um, at 2020, um, there's just it's hard to compare because there is no benchmark for this, and so there's an outpouring of support. What our organization or even other nonprofits in this town or across, across the country are facing is, we don't know if donors will continue to be supportive, not only during COVID, um, but post COVID. So, uh, you know, th this, this sort of might sound, it, 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 fundraising is art and science, right? You look at data, um, and you see where you land, and it's also about relationships. And so right now, um, what I, the data that I've seen um, uh, in Massachusetts specifically, is that donors are continuing to give to the causes that matter to them pre-pandemic, and that they are also giving to relief, COVID relief. And that is 
a wonderful indication. I think now more than ever, certainly a lot of organizations need the the, the support. Um, but for how long? You know, as a fundraiser, I always think about a donor can't sustain our work in perpetuity and forever. How do we sustain the work? Um, so for the foundation. We're focused on safety net funding because that is a high need and will continue to be. Um, and um, we're also thinking about uh, scholarship um, and we're thinking about um, our, our sort of uh, core fund of uh, the Brookline Fund, which essentially supports the foundation and our operations. And it's uh, the, the fund that we use to do our own grant making. Uh, and so right now we're on track. I think we're going to be okay, but I just had a conversation with a board member this morning where I, 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 the words were, it seems we're maybe tracking, but I can't tell because we can't even benchmark against this. Um, and so um, we're going to evaluate every three months or so to see how our progress is um, against the need, against the targets. But uh, what, what I do feel confident about is um, the relationships and the partnerships within this community are really strong, at least in relation to the, the BCF. And um, I'm a fundraiser. I never want to miss goal. I'm going to hit it. Uh, uh, and, and the way to do that, and someone asked me, Someone asked me, I think it was yesterday, I had a conversation with someone around, you know, what are you thinking about Target and how are you going to meet that? And um, uh, and uh, what my predecessor, I think, often thought about um, uh, wanting to be here for the first million dollar gift. And someone asked me, do you, do you also have that goal? And I said very immediately, I, I don't know that the million dollar gift matters, meaning um, if we can articulate a compelling vision for impact in Brookline and align our work and our programs and our partnerships to meet that vision, it could be a million dollars, it could be $50, it could be $1,000. Actually, as long as people are engaged in our work and in the work of the organization and are committed to this community, the results will be there. Um, but I don't want to anchor on the fundraising. You have to anchor on the work and the impact. So that's that's my orientation. I think a lot of people uh, think the same thing that you first thought of when you looked at what the foundation does. How could there be a need in Brookline? And so I wonder how you're addressing that. Uh, making it known out in the wider Brookline world that Brookline is not the place that you think it might be. I've start, started uh, giving out food through Brookline Thrives and uh, have been struck by the people who come to get food. And I'm ashamed to say, just as you were ashamed to say, that I never expected people these type of people, which is the most awful thing one could ever say or think, come to get food. So, uh, so how do we uh, make known that that there is this kind of need in a place like Brookline? That's a um, a terrific question, and um, and and I think a concern that um, almost every a uh, grantee of the foundation has shared with me their challenge around the perception of Brookline being affluent and therefore that means there is no need. And, and I'll go further to say, um, many of them have said to me, if we try to seek funding outside of Brookline, they say, you're Brooklyn based, you should be fine, go get funding there. And if we seek funding in Brookline, we have a hard time sharing with our own community that there is need and how to make that case. And part of that, um, I think part of that is, and this might sound small, but it's critical, it's not having the organizational infrastructure and funding to be able to tell that story. And so as simple as as how are you messaging the work? Do you have a blast? How are, what are you saying in your appeals? And, and I know that sounds small, but it, it's all about 
your story and telling that story. Uh, we all understand the power of the media, right? And when you have organizations that are at mostly, and this is my experience with the nonprofit work and certainly with program teams, you're focused on the program. You're focused on serving the community, not on how to tell your story about serving the community. But if you don't invest in that kind of work, there's, you're not gonna get that message at scale. And so that's just one, I think, way of combating that perception, which is, I think, one of the things that the foundation did a few years ago around putting out the Understanding Brookline report. And almost every person that I've talked to uh, in those first three months said that report, that changed the way that I saw about, uh, you know, I saw uh, my community. Um, and how can the foundation continue to do that? And so. That is part of our mission and work, doing research and convenings and um, putting out information. But I think even to go further than putting out information, uh, developing coalitions with people to be able to then address those needs that, that we've both identified that are there um, and you know, being in partnership with others. So um, I hope that that answers a little bit of, of this. It does. Perception Thank challenge. you. Thank you. And almost no, uh, no nonprofit that I've talked to uh, to date has said to me, I have a communications person. They're sort of doing it, you know, on the side. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it is an, an area of expertise. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Giselle. I really, really appreciate this. So one question, I have two questions. One is, do you work with other towns or, or, um, nonprofits or whatever, like in Cambridge or another community. Um, and my other question, because I've always thought of this for um, our club, uh, is I've always thought, you know, there's the client base who, who can benefit what well, all this work is done to give them help. And I would like to see them on our boards. Uh, part of the decision making. So when it's the community, it's really the people that we're giving to, because I think there's always room for something to go wrong when it's like, I know the community rather than I am part of that community. Is there any way that you engage those people on a more, uh, what's the word, uh, the same level rather than yes. helping? The short answer is yes. Um, and I, what I'll share about that is um, at my last organization, one of the things mm -hmm. that was a big learning for me, uh, I, was, I was working in an organization that worked to address the social determinants of health. So food as health housing as health. If you don't have transportation or can pay your utility, your utility bill, you don't have electricity, you're not going to be able to take your, uh, your diabetes, your insulin, because you need refrigeration for that. And so really thinking about all of the factors that impact health. And one of the learnings that I had um, as, a, as a person that was not in a program team, but that, that was telling the story of our work was uh, we need to tell the story um, faster. Where's our strategy? What about our outcomes? What's the impact? And I was really focused on on that part of our work. And a program team member, she was our vice president of strategy, shared it with me, Giselle, we have to go slowly. And the reason we have to go slowly is because we can't develop solutions to the challenges that moms, black mothers in Mattapan are facing without actually having them identi identify what the problem is, what the barrier is and what would help solve for that. And therefore, if you involve community, it's gonna go much, much slower. We could design it ourselves, but it wouldn't be as good, the, the, the intervention, and we wouldn't have the outcomes that we seek. So I think, you know, if I apply that uh, to the work of the Community Foundation, um, I think that the principle around do nothing about us without us. So 
if someone is interested in creating a, a scholarship program uh, that uh, sort of supports Latinas uh, in this country, I'm a great person to ask. But if you had others who were trying to develop, uh, 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 remove barriers, and you didn't have that constituent as part of the conversation, you're just not going to get very far. Uh, so we are absolutely looking to engage community members that we support um, in uh, shaping how we do our work. Part of it is the grant making side. Um, and part of it is sort of in that dialogue and convening piece around who's at the table uh, to have the conversation and then who's at the table to make those decisions. Giselle, thank you so much. As I said initially, wishing you luck. I think we are very fortunate in having you here in Brookline. Welcome. Thank you. I'd love to just extend an invitation for anyone who wants to continue the conversation. Uh, I would be uh, thrilled to be able to do that with, with all of you, with any of you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really generous. I think the subsequent conversation is how can the Rotary be more supportive and engaged or in what way? And Bo, you've been the model for that. Well, so I, I think it's I, I didn't do it alone. Believe me, I had a lot of help from our club as well. So thank you. Well, it's a very material, fun, you know, concrete connection that we have. That I think that is so great. So, well, Susan uh, inspired me to do it. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't do the heavy lifting. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still recovering from it, but I think I'll be okay. <laughs> well, it's good to oh, that back. Oh, that back. You'll, you'll be seeing more of me. Thanks, Richard. Take yeah. care, everybody. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Yeah. Happy New Year. Yeah.